have a wonderful speaker, Del Clyte, and he is going to talk about regenerative agriculture. Now, just so everybody's aware, you are muted and your video is turned off. If you have any questions at any point during, um, during the, this talk, you can use the Q&A feature and I will read them out and we will answer them as we go. And also just so everybody's aware, at the end, whenever you exit the webinar, you will be sent a link or redirected to do a survey. It's like a two minute survey and we would appreciate if you fill that out. But we'll go ahead and we'll let Dell get started. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, and letting me be involved in this and, and sorry for the technical difficulties. On my end, at, at my age, it's uh, pretty much out of my realm of expertise to even call into a Zoom meeting. So that's why I stick to doing cool things with uh, the soil and plants and, and trying to help families and communities. So uh, with that being said, uh, you know, we, we get to talk to a lot of people around the country and uh, a lot of people around the world for that matter in what we've tried to do. You know, I. I certainly, uh, I wasn't the first person to do any of this, and I'm not the best person at this, but I'm most likely the, the most persistent and vocal about the change we need in agriculture, uh, starting from a, from a regenerative level. And many of you have probably read some of my quotes or some of my ramblings or all that and I really believe the first step in regenerative ag is regenerating the mind because we've spent a lot of time being told a lot of things that probably didn't have our best interest at heart. Um, I equate it to suffering from the Stockholm syndrome where we've become friends with our captors and and I was a big part of being captive to the system uh, for several years and um, I really do believe I had a calling in wanting to change. I had a, uh, my grandfather was just a, a beautiful naturalist and really guided me as a, as a child and, a, and as a young man to do things in a natural way, even though I, I kind of fell off the wagon and, and went into agriculture in a very large scale on a conventional level. Um, but I really think we have a lot to learn from our mistakes more than probably the successes. So with that being said, um, my operation has went from a several thousand acre operation to just a few hundred acres. And we went from, like I said, doing a lot of things wrong that people were telling us that we had to do to make money to doing things very much in sync with nature and it's and we've got to see the the benefits of that not only just with the soil and our livestock but how the neighborhood is slowly starting to um, become more involved and we've got really good people involved with our operation. We, we certainly couldn't have done any of this without you know, Carrie Hofsnyder's hard work in, in helping us really facilitate these changes. We can be boots on the ground here and, and do things, but without someone helping tell the story and uh, to get that word out, it, it would have been very hard for us to, to gain as much success as we've had already that, you know, that quickly. Uh, my personal story is uh, yes, farming in a very large-esque way up until about 1999 to 2000, two or three, we really had to do a lot of changing. I've had a series of back surgeries that um, took me out of that ability to sit in a tractor cab all day, which even though this morning I my back went out again and things like that. And as I was crawling into the bathroom to brush my teeth this morning, I still thank God for that happening because it took me out of those things that, that I wasn't doing right. And so when all that happened, 
Um, I got a chance to go to college for the first time because when I was going to go to college after high school, uh, my dad had a heart attack and I was here on the farm to help him. Uh, I'll take a step farther back to give a, a really big overview. Um, during the 80s farm crisis, uh, it, was, it was quite different for me as my father didn't co-sign any of my notes, but I co-signed his. So as a teenager, um, I was thrust into the big time business world of farming gone wrong in a lot of ways. And at that time I had a group of registered Hereford cows that were all paid for. Um, my dad didn't have a lot of debt, but any kind of debts bothered my father. So knowing that he was probably gonna get some pressure at some time with the changing times, I stopped at the bank one day I was coming home from school and said, you know, is there some way I can help um, you know, my dad out with this, you know, more security or I don't want him to have the pressure of this. And the banker was one of my dad's best friends. Um, and he was pretty much blown away, you know, that I was going to do that or I'd offered that up. But long story short that, you know, I, I don't have a lot of patience for people that say they can't do anything or they've started behind the eight ball or whatever, because if you set your mind to it, you're gonna be able to do it. And if you surround yourselves yourself with good mentors, you really get a feeling like you can do anything, even, even though you know a lot of things aren't gonna work, there's gonna be successes in it. So uh, age 20, my, my dad turned the operation over to me completely and that wasn't a glamorous turnover that was debt uh, worn out machinery and soil that needed to be fixed but I didn't know that the soil needed to be fixed at that time fast forward back to the back surgeries and all that um, got a chance to go to college and had a chance to work in the medical field first uh, on a very limited basis as a radiology tech until my back blew out again and I did uh, billing and coding hospital administration, and I ended up managing a medical clinic in Lincoln for four and a half years, which gave me a great perspective from these people coming in um, from the city talking about farmers and, you know, why were they so protective or why, what's going on out there? Why, what are they hiding? And my dad was still alive at that point, and I, I came home and I always talked to my mom and dad, fill, fill them in on everything I was doing. and. And, uh, you know, I told them, I said, you know, the people really don't have a good um, perception of us in agriculture. I said, what are we trying to hide? And my dad's like, you're right. He, and he was always a big proponent of letting people come out. He goes, we really need to open the doors. We need to let people come out. And so from that point on, we really started to get people out. First and foremost, seeing our cows and what we're doing. And then later on in the last 15 years or so, in the transition of what we were doing from regen or from conventional to regenerative. And I'll, I'll just, I'll stop right now. I'm sure there's no questions, but I don't want to be talking if there is. Are we good? Yeah, I don't have any questions since then yet. Okay, sounds great. Um, so our whole, our whole deal several years ago was we we really got to look and talk. We got to look at a lot of different soils. We got to talk to a lot of different people in all areas of agriculture about how do we really regenerate this. So our farm, in a lot of ways, became a a proving ground or a testing ground for, you know, can we make it better here? And if we can make it better here, we know our neighbors across the fence can make it better. And then we also know that our neighbors around the world can take something we're doing on the regenerative level and apply it in their areas. Yes, that it needs to be tweaked, different environments, different soil, all that, different you know crops they want to raise. But the really cool thing about regenerative ag is it works every place on some level. And my dream is 
in a few years, and I hope I've contributed some to this, is that we don't even talk about regenerative ag. It's just agriculture again. Because the regenerative part is what we used to do, like what my grandfather was doing and his brothers that were doing all this cool stuff and all of our neighbors, um, you know, and then we all kind of fell into that trap where many, many farmers and ranchers are still at today, most likely, probably, I was just trying to figure this the other day, probably 98% of them are still in that trap. Um, and we, we see how detrimental that is to the entire system. I'm a firm believer in if we get the soil right, I know it will change all of society. Because everyone that comes out here that is a doubter, there's non-believer. We've got a few areas that we think we're doing really well on the soil. We got a lot of areas we need to work better on. But as soon as they touch it and appreciate it, and you know, it, it's it is like a drug. It's full of so many beneficial things. A lot of the same beneficial things that are in healthy bodies are in healthy soil. But I know when everyone is busy doing something with the soil, touching it every day, no matter what, if it's a garden, if it's, you know, greenhouses, we work with um, some Indian tribes across the country that uh, they're, they're, they're the first, or they were the first regenerative people. It is really bred into them. I think it's been bred out of all of us Europeans. We're a little slower on the uptake on, on things. Um, but we know when that, that swells right, we know the community changes. We know that when people are busy and they feel appreciated and valued, that all the violence goes down, unemployment rate goes down, our food becomes better, the economy becomes better, the environment in general is better through all of this. So that's a long introduction to where we're at with what we're doing here, but we have to really understand the bigger picture because farmers don't always get the chance to get out of their own backyards much. And I've always been fortunate from a little boy riding with my dad and the banker and all those guys in bus trips all across the country. I think I'd been to every state before I was probably 14. And I've got to go back and see all these farming and ranching operations all across every state. And some in Canada, some in Mexico, and, and then talking to people across the world on how they can change. So the big picture is we have to understand that big picture before we can come back and understand what we're doing here. So all we were trying to do here is, is to make things healthier and all the way around, very holistic in a healthy manner. So what we got to figure out first was our soils were dying and we were killing them. Most of the soils across the world are depleted in some way, shape, or form. There's pockets where there's still good soil. There might be 15 feet of topsoil now, and you're like, wow, that's, you know, that's amazing that in those areas there still could be that much. Well, that's probably only half of what it started. So when we look at our fragile topsoil and what we're doing, just say in eastern Nebraska, there isn't much really good soil out there. The soil is, has had a lot of things put into it that should have never went into the soil. But when we think about all, you know, we, we use weapons as uh, in our soil now in conventional agriculture. So, so many of those weapons and, and everything they were using in World War II, when that war was over, what did they do with them? Well, a lot of them came into this system. You know, when we think about the synth synthetic fertilizers and things like that, um, the chemicals and everything that were used to 
in warfare, you know, why does that make sense? And, you know, I never thought about it very deep either years ago, but it's horrifying when we think about what we're putting into that soil. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm not trying to bash anybody because I've been in all this, but anhydrous ammonia, if it kills you, if it can kill you, what does it do to all that soil life? So it's just like, you know, if we need a permit to do something, maybe it's not the right thing. And I know there's good permits, you know, to for local foods and things like that. But when it needs permits to apply things, that doesn't sound like it's in tune with nature. So what we've done here is, you know, we were going broke in a really quick fashion because everyone else was making money and telling us to put these harmful things in our soil. My mom is 100% Czech. She shoots straight. She's 86 and she knows everything what's going on in this operation. Her and I sat down years and years ago and she says, she's like, where's all our money going? And I said, well, you know, we buy this machinery, buy these chemicals, buy the fertilizer, all the interest at the bank and all this. And she goes, so it's the, it's the damn middleman. I said, totally. And I said, we're going backwards. It's taking us more and more to raise the same amount or less. And she's hit her hand on the table and she said, send them packing. So I had the chance to go out that morning and make a difference on cutting out the middlemen and starting to build our soil and starting to build for generations, you know, not, not in a BS legacy deal like farmers talk about, they gotta own more ground or they gotta do something that's for the kids. It's not for the kids. You know, if they treated their kids like they treated their soil, someone would take their children away. So get in that mindset of, we want to work with people that want to work with us, and we want to work with soil that's beautiful or plants that are beautiful. And there's so many ways to start. I've talked to people all over the country. I still say that the person that's got one tomato plant on their deck in New York City knows as much or more about soil and farming as nearly all the farmers do. And I was in that boat. I thought I knew it all. I knew nothing about it. I knew the harmful ways, but I knew nothing about it. Uh, any questions? Everybody might be asleep. No, no questions. We did just have someone mention that it was a compelling story and we'd like you to share. Ooh, something did come in. Okay, so why do you think it is so difficult to get more farmers to embrace regenerative agriculture when the benefits are so obvious? Hasn't the chemically driven ways been so easy because you use recipes? Regenerative ag does not have recipes. So it's like the, the base of the question was, why do you think it's so difficult to get farmers to embrace regenerative bag when, when the benefits are obvious? Um, perception, 100% perception. So when we think about what farmers are, or what they like to see or what they've been programmed to do, they're raising monoculture crops, mostly corn, soybeans, whatever. They love to see straight rows. Most of them love to see black soil, which is horrible. I mean, it's, it's devastating when it's bare. They, they like the neatness and the orderliness of what that looks like to their neighbors. Now we have to take a step back. We, we've lost a lot of our great relationships with our neighbors. My grandfather that I was speaking of had a great quote. I always messed up. I'll try to get it right. The day the horses left and the tractor came was the day we replaced community with competition. No longer did you need that threshing crew, that crew to help do all this, the, neighbor, the neighborliness, the working together. 
you became independent, you could do more by yourself, depending on the size of your equipment. And you looked across the fence and Frank was no longer your neighbor. He was your competitor. You, you got the idea that you could do better than him and then you will do better in life, which totally blows all the theories away that, that nature provides the, the balance, the instinct, the harmony. So yes, it's regenerative ag doesn't look like conventional ag. We've got fields that you plant cover crops in and it's a multi-species deal and yes it's uneven there's tall there's short there's skinny there's wide there's dark green there's light green there's blooms there's different heads shooting up that that is when when you really start getting in sync with nature stuff like that is it's beauty it's not a mistake so people tend to look at it as well what are neighbors going to think if my field looks like that. Well, if they're smart, they're gonna know you're gonna be making more money. Last night's big rain event we had here, you know, the only water that really hurt us coming through here was the water coming through off of a neighbor's field. I'm blessed now that my cousin is farming everything around for the most part. And my other family members are starting to do the right things too, to hold more of that water, to that, that water infiltration is so important. The, I can keep going on and on why, why there's benefits to this, but back to they have to regenerate their mind before they can start regenerating their farm. And that perception deal is a big part of, of what's holding them back. We've always done it this way. What are people gonna think? I've always been told that it takes the farmer an average of 70 years to change and people are like that's crazy dell people change faster than that one thing a great example that i just been thinking about in the last couple months is we started note telling my cousin and i started note telling way back like 30 years ago but no-till was actually a big idea in the 1950s you know, there was there was machinery companies making no-till planters in the 1950s. So these people now that are thinking like, wow, you know, there's some machinery out there to actually no-till with now. No, they tried it. They were ahead of the game. No, it, you know, the, the universities and the chemical companies and all these, you know, everyone trying to sell something in that old way never let it pick up. And the economy was better too. They didn't need to change. So if we think about that in the 1950s, we're in the year 2020, that looks like it's about 70 years. More people are now finally adapting no-till practices where they're not using any tillage. They're planting right into that seed bed. And some think they can never do it. Some think that they can't do it in their area. They will give you a million reasons why they can't and they will not let their minds think of one reason why they can we also have to remember that the government has rewarded and so continues to reward these practices that are not good for the soil are not good for our economy they're good for politicians and they're cronies that make money off of being a buddy to a politician so we, we started here like other people have, I just became more vocal about it, is turning that system upside down. Because think about the word system. Nature is not a system. Healthy cattle, good meat, you know, nutrient dense vegetables, stuff like that, they're not a system they're they're a form of art that was created for us thousands and thousands of years ago it all started in balance man is the biggest detriment to the nature man when they're mankind when they're misinformed are a very dangerous 
uh, tool to have out there. So all I'm trying to do is inform people. And so that's what we're doing here. We get thousands of visitors, um, a lot of visitors from all over the world. And like I said, we're not doing it the best or we didn't do it the earliest. But preaching that gospel of we got to get this right. Look at what we're doing, at least on these small patches. Look at this cow herd that receives no vaccinations, receives nothing but the plants that are grown right here. Look at all that. And then, and then you can look at your children or your grandchildren and say, there's hope. The hope's not in buying another thousand acres of ground. If you're getting larger in agriculture, it shows you're not making any money. Why on earth would you get larger at not making any money? Or larger because you're making just a few dollars an acre. The mindset, we have to break the mindset. And that's what we like doing here is getting these people, the doubters, the promoters, the whatever. We've had we've had people, every type of person here, and they all become one when they figure out the power of that soil. And I know I'm more into philosophy this morning than I am to, into practices, but the practices fall into place very easily when we change our whole mindset. Sorry, that was a very long answer to your short question. Is there anything else? No, no questions right now. Just some stuff I'll get to you at the end. Oh, nope, one just came in. I stand corrected. Um, let me see. It's that bad? No, it was just long. Um, Willie, <laughs> since this kind of leans a little bit on about government and politics and stuff, I will get this question to Dell at the end because we can't get too political um, for because of me as an AmeriCorps member and such, but I will save yeah, this good. question uh, for Dell later. Yes, anything like that that you want to send to me, we will we will talk through how what we're seeing and it's just you know what we're seeing it does not reflect what you guys are doing. So yep. no, that's awesome. Yeah, perfect, because yeah, I'll get this to to you at the end and uh, so that perfect. you can still answer that. Great. So what we're doing here, practice wise, is uh, you know, we we were lucky enough to be able to start a little meat company for our our beef business. Um, in I think we launched it January 2015. About that same time, we trademarked our breed of cattle. Uh, we call them Graze Masters. They they're they're a four-way cross uh, currently of Red Angus, Hereford, Semitol, and Obrac. They will always be of a of a multi-breed makeup to to have the benefits of each good thing that's in each breed. But that too is as much of a philosophy as anything because we, we want people to understand that a lot of the things available out there like in the cattle, like there's so many, so many different things that are available yet they're not, um, they're not, maybe so adaptable to this type of operation. They might be feedlot oriented, you know, things like that. And so for the last 30 years, we could not find cattle that were acclimated to what we were doing or what we were trying to get to. That's why we just build our own breed. Um, my dad always wanted to do something like that. Uh, he also wanted a little meat business, things like that. So, you know, yes, yeah, somewhat in his honor, we wanted to do something like that, but it was also great ideas um, that, that certainly now are working very well. The meat company is, you know, everyone knows with, with the disruption in our, our whole food system, which a lot of us knew that that was pretty messed up. Um, you know, when people go and see those empty shelves, 
it really changes their mind on, wow, maybe this bigger food system that we're tracking all this stuff from far away, maybe it won't get here if it gets really bad. Maybe that'll just stop. So on the meat side of things, the the just the or the meat orders, you know, we're a year and a half out now on on meat orders because, you know, people are are trusting what operations like ours are doing. They want to know who's raising it. They want to see how it's raised, and all that good stuff. And so back to the open door policy of let people see what you're doing, because they might have some really cool ideas too on. You know, well, why aren't you doing this? You know, because they're, they don't have any of those preconceived notions coming from a farm. They're looking at it as, as people that really want a good product and they, they really want, um, you know, that stability and everything, not for their, just for their family, but for people all around. So our, our, our cattle have evolved into kind of a, a perfect, situation to help people with the local food um, but it also we've got to show the industry that you do not need to do all this crazy stuff with your cattle if you get them back to natural environments so we used to have veterinary bills that were several thousand dollars just crazy because We'd have to give vaccines for these cattle that were coming into these dry or muddy lots, even if no matter how much we cleaned them, you know, they were, they were still contaminated in some way. So we jam them in this really false environment. And so they, they couldn't get out and graze. They couldn't get away from anything that was setting in that soil. Um, so when we got these cattle out, back in tune with nature, so we went from, you know, a ten or twelve thousand dollar veterinarian bill to like a six hundred dollar because we still have to check our bulls and make sure they can breed cows and we still have to do a, a few things like that. But that blows people's mind, you know, when when you can save money like that, and our and our cattle have never been healthier. No longer do they receive any like chemical delicing, pour on, anything like that. They're in sync with nature. And what isn't in sync, nature will call out. They'll, you know, we'll see they're not doing as well. We'll, you know, move them on into a different marketing deal. But the the biggest part of regenerative ag is the soil, but the biggest benefit is the savings and that's hard for people to understand that you're just saving money because so many people don't equate that to something tangible they like they like a check to show them you know what it cost but we we see the substantial savings on the other end because we're not writing as many checks so if you're a larger operation and you haven't went to no-till and you haven't used cover crops and you've got all a you know, huge line of equipment that's all brand new and and you know you might have two million dollars worth of machinery debt. If you went to a no-till system or you went to a system with your cattle that they were grazing more and you weren't, you know, providing all this feed that needs extra equipment to haul it in, extra manpower, your savings are huge. But those savings aren't just huge on a money deal. They're, it, it equates to better soil. It equates to a better family, better health, more time with that family. It allows more people to come in. Maybe you're doing more things, a few more things by hand. Like we're going to plant our, our vegetables for our community, um, hopefully in the next two weeks that they're gonna come in and just, you know, hand pick what they want. But maybe it's looking at different operations like that, that, okay, so we can't do that from a tractor seat, but, you know, that young couple down the road that we don't really know, I wonder if they wouldn't be interested in that. I'm gonna stop and talk to them. Nonetheless, it provides us the chance to rebuild community in a, ba in a very basic level, and it's crazy. 
when we don't know our neighbors and we don't know what they're interested in and you know all that back to it's regenerating the whole system and we've done that you know with with these cattle we've done that helping young people get started we've got a great couple just south of us that work you know tire, tirelessly for what we're doing they've added the bees to our program now because we have the right plants or we're going in the right direction of the right plants uh, to entice these pollinators and they do very very well and their honey is very pure and you know it's just it's very indicative of what we're trying to do so you know we'd love to set up more families doing something that we're all working together that they can make some money we're making the environment better we're making the food system better and things like that so i go back to it really is a community deal but our community is is global and you know the biggest lie in agriculture is we have to feed the world well that that's you know started a lot a lot of years ago by people that just want to make money off that process when we teach our global neighbors how they can do it better for themselves that's a win-win you know because we've improved the whole dichotomy of that family and starting to rebuild what they're doing and things like that any questions so far um no brenda i don't know if yours cut out or not but she started something okay well, as of right now you have yeah. a question do you have anything that you want to run past me? Okay, well, okay, so she said the movie, The Biggest Little Farm is all about regenerative agriculture. How can we get local people interested? Um, and I got, yes, I love that movie. I got a chance to watch it on an airplane last fall uh, with a gentleman that knew nothing about it um, long story short, we were talking, he asked about a book I was reading and it was grain by grain, um, Bob Quinn's book on how, you know, we have to make our food better, things like that. Got to watch it. Love the theory. What the, the question is, how do we get that started is people that have land, most of it, we are not optimizing it anyway and I'm a firm believer in if farmers have it in their heart and they can provide one two three acres whatever for people to try things that's how we get it started but we people don't just offer that up because back to perception what's what's somebody going to think if somebody's got a whole bunch of bees in the corner of our field, or what are they gonna think if we, you know, we're raising a different crop because this couple next to us wants to run sheep or goats. If there, there has to be some way, and if anyone can call me, email me, whatever, and I'll help them in any way to point them in the right direction of people I know that would be willing to do this. It's back to community. The farmer doesn't know well, people don't know what they don't know. So the farmer doesn't know that there might be somebody that want, wants to do this. They don't even know if they should be doing it because they're not even running their own farm, you know, a different generation is or whatever. But it's just that communication that we so lack that causes so much trouble. So these people that, you know, they're, they're, there's opportunities every place. And a lot of it doesn't take a lot of money to get started. Uh, you just look at like a free range chicken type deal or anything. We've worked with every kind of operation from aquaponics to the craziest, you know, things on earth that people want to try. And all they need is neighbors that 
you know, will will allow them to do that. And it, it becomes a beautiful relationship down the road too. So yeah, there's a lot of ways and anyone can contact myself or Carrie Hausner that works with us. We would love to at least throw some ideas out and things like that to try to help. Perfect, and we do have a couple more questions. Okay. So what are your thoughts on dung beetles in regenerative agriculture? If you have Oh any. my gosh. <laughs> someone, uh, someone knows my heart. Wow. Dung beetles, well, they basically are our salvation. So, um, so the Egyptians worshiped dung beetles thousands of years ago. They're painted on the walls of their pyramids. Um, the, the dung beetle is, is a very important part of what we're trying to do in rebuilding the soil on this farm. And we've got to see it all over the country where it's worked. Years ago, we didn't have any dung beetle population to speak of because we were using um, sprays and chemical type deals on our, on our cow herd that you know, they were shedding that and it was basically taking, you know, all, all the dung beetles were, were gone. So when we stopped doing all that, we got to see the dung beetles start back. You know, there's, I think over 2000 species of dung beetles. When I was a little kid, there was these huge ones, they called them rollers, and they would be rolling this turd ball across the place. And I remember seeing those and, you know, we don't have the rollers back yet, but we're, we're seeing a lot of different dung beetles, like the tunnelers and things like that. So when you feed them, start to come back in the pasture, you know you're trying to get things right. And we just started an experiment a couple of days ago uh, with uh, High Plains biochar out of uh, Wyoming. We're utilizing some biochar in our mineral and also in a lick tub type deal that is gonna stimulate that dung beetle activity even more, and what they're gonna do is they're gonna pull that biochar down into the soil quicker, and they're gonna, we're gonna improve the soil you know, that much faster because of what the dung beetles naturally are doing. Dung beetles are a huge part of getting a holistic operation or regenerative operation going in the right direction with livestock. Um, I, I would talk dung beetles all day, great question. <laughs> all right. Another question, how many acres and how many head of cattle do you currently have? So right now we run about 70 mature cows plus some replacement heifers plus our meat animals on this operation where we have uh, a little less than 300 acres of grass. Some of that's actually put up for hay. So when we do our ultra high density grazing, which we'll start, well, we're doing some now, but we're removing cows every day. You know, we can get, uh, we can maintain a, a animal unit on one acre year round. That's not the same acre, you know, it's going to different types of forages. So we're becoming very efficient there. We can do better, but uh, right now we still have a lot of monoculture type grass where we have brome that was seeded 50 years ago on old farm ground that you know we're overseeding with clovers and we're bringing back warm season grasses through uh, what we call extreme grazing where we're tromping out a lot of the cool season and thinning it up so the warm season seed that's already there can be germinated um, from years ago. So yeah, we're, we're uh, pretty efficient on that. It's, I'm gonna be anxious to see if we can become more efficient and we're in a pretty good rainfall area too. So I've got clients that are in Arizona or New Mexico that might run one pair to 640 acres and we're shooting to run two pair on 640 acres. So improving our efficiencies by 50%. So the more time you spend, the better your grass is, the better your soil is, the more animals you can run on it. Is that all the questions? Okay. Um, we have a couple questions about contact info, which we can get at the end. 
Um, and I just had one come in. Let me read it really quick. Sorry that my cat's yelling. Um, okay, so it is, it's a long one. So I believe the disruption in the food distribution system presently experienced is going to dramatically grow the direct online food supply system from regenerative agriculture. More consumers are experiencing tasty, healthy food for the first time and will continue to support the supply chain. Do you agree and can you expand on this? Oh my gosh, absolutely, I agree. I mean, I, <laughs> it was, we, we're in a mess with our food system, um, not just from a, a supply standpoint or a transportation standpoint, but from uh, the nutrients that are no longer in a lot of this food because the soil is depleted. So yes, absolutely, that, that's a mess. We gotta make that better. Um, the, the technology with, with all the online things out there is perfect even though not all areas have it yet. It, it slightly scares me that, you know, if a system like that for communication would go down, if everything really went as bad as it could, then, you know, how do we, how do we know who's needing the food? Uh, you know, you're, you're more back to a 30 acre or 30 mile radius of, you know, word of mouth trying to sell that. So uh, I think there's going to be all kinds of new opportunities keep coming because people have looked at this differently now and people that are experts in areas that I am not um, in the communication and transportation and, and things like that, I think are really going to, it's going to come to fruition on how we continue to make this better and better because we really are all in this together and we do not want to forget about anyone. Um, you know, we don't want to forget about people in our own community or people, you know, around the world, but we know that we have to, what we always will be able to do is to concentrate on these that are closer to us, which goes back to more people back on the land with a regenerative mindset, with those opportunities to raise food in their areas is going to be nothing but a benefit for us. Right. Perfect. And another question, how long does it take to reclaim spent land? Um, so every soil type is different. And so it can, uh, some takes a little bit longer, some takes different techniques. Uh, what we're seeing here on, you know, we're heavy clay soil and it was pretty decent soil at one time, but if we do everything right, uh, as far as multi-species cover crops, animal impact, uh, things like that, the second to third year, you're already seeing improvement in organic matter. Um, your soil is starting to become healthier. It maybe has a little, you know, more of a black look to it again, which is the carbon that's, that's captured in there, which is another whole thing we need to concentrate on is pulling that carbon out of the air, keeping it in the soil where it needs to be that, you know, helps us raise, you know, good quality foods and things like that. Um, so to really do it right on our farm, we've done a couple fields hardcore and they're near, nearly back to native prairie state of about seven to eight percent organic matter and there's diversity and things like that coming through and there's a lot of life in the soil. Of course, the earthworm is the first macro uh, beneficial that we can see. And when they start coming back, um, they're doing amazing, amazing things for the soil. So I don't know why we'd ever want to kill those little guys, you know, with running through with equipment or putting anything on it because um, if anybody's really interested in earthworms, Darwin, yes, Darwin, was just an earthworm fanatic and wrote an entire book about him. And it's a must read for nerds like me, like I read dung beetle and earthworm books. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it takes a little while, 
but it can be done. We can rejuvenate any soil, any place. It may take a little longer, it may take different techniques, but we know we can do it um, because uh, well, we, we have to, you know, our lives depend on it. There's some really good questions coming in. So another one, how do you convince old dogs, as in old farmers, to learn new tricks like regenerative agriculture? Uh, well, if they're real old, it's easier because <laughs> I'll say, well, I'll say, you, you saw it was better one time in your life. You got to see back in the day when they maybe overseeded some red clover and wheat so they would feed the soil with that, you know, pick some nitrogen and, and be able to have some cattle feed after they took that weed off or whatever. Um, I, I really believe there's no one I can't convince, especially if they're standing on my place, because what the ears can't hear, the eyes can't deny. And when people see it, they'll believe it. But they have to really see it. They have to have boots on the ground to see it. So um, we have a lot of politics in families, too, that is, is really hard to break through. And I get to see it around me all the time where maybe grandpa's still writing the checks for the dad and the son that are doing the work, but you know, it, it, it's more work than it needs to be and it's pretty damaging. So um, I'm not really answering that question for that particular person very well. Uh, it does take time and it does take an understanding uh, and it does take a little bit of your heart to get it right. And I tend to pull on people's heartstrings pretty hard in this transition deal and not necessarily guilt them, but I've said this a hundred times, I have more faith in their potential than individuals have in their own potential. I know everyone can do this. I know people have been beat up through this whole system and there's a lot of other people that don't want them to change, but I know each person can change and I love talking to people about how we can change that. So anyone can, can contact me and there's a lot of other people like me out and about that would love to talk to them too. Perfect. We'll go ahead and we'll do a last call for questions because it is 11. So if you have a question, go ahead and send them in here. Um, while, we, while we wait for some of those, do you have, have any last things you would like to share, Bill? Um, I guess mostly, you know, we, we all come from an agrarian base. We were, we were, we were created through the soil. We'll go back to the soil someday. And uh, so it is in us. It's diluted. It's stifled. It's blocked off. It's whatever you want to call it. But if we don't get this right, I tell a lot of people, this isn't about me at all. But when my granddaughter is helping me do stuff for both of them now and soon to be three of them, they, it's for them. My legacy is not a damn tractor. It's not owning more farm ground. It's not putting on this show, this, this vanity, if you will, because if we continue down that road, the soil will be depleted fully because there's places all over the world that it's completely depleted. Our water, because we don't have the soil right and so we don't get that water to soak in, will be gone or it'll be contaminated from the chemicals we're using. So I don't go around the country and talk to people and preach about this for me. I preach about it for the generations to come that will live through absolute hell if the farmer doesn't get it right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have, we have a few questions that have rolled in. 
Um, so Brenda with yours, we'll, we'll save that at the end as well. She wants to know about bringing her class to your farm and we can do that after. So what okay. kind of process would need to happen to create more community gardens in Lincoln? If you have uh, an just opinion getting on that. people. Oh, I've got an opinion on everything. It's, it's <laughs> cool because it's so like, um, just that desire if there's a desire there's i know there's somebody out there that would allow uh people to come in i, I got a friend that lives in canada that goes to detroit a lot he's he's you know basically hands-on now with a lot of those detroit gardens and um there's we think about all the everything's an opportunity to raise a garden if it's on a little porch if it's raised bed gardens um you know, in a deserted alley, if it's, you know, larger scale where there's some little patches of, of soil in these towns, um, it's just finding those people or maybe even stopping and asking, you know, who owns that or a lot, you know, we think about it, there's, a, even at Lincoln, there's a lot of these properties that are owned by the city that they haven't done anything in years with. That's an opportunity for us to talk to them and to bring the community together. Um, and one of my favorite stories is there's a gentleman in, in Los Angeles that was a gang leader. And we've got to correspond by email. These guys, I mean, they were badass. These guys are gardeners now. And they're ro raising food in every place they can. Like I told him, I said, when you're standing, stopping at McDonald's to get a cup of coffee. When you look out and you see a bare patch of soil by McDonald's and you think opportunity, you know you've got it in your heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Um, let me try and go back up to the top here. All right, so we have, are you certified organic? I am not, we could be, um, but we are not for the fact that, I mean, one thing we sell under is natural by tradition. We're just doing it like my grandfather's on both sides were doing it, like many people around. Um, I think that is another good tool. I think some people use that in a very responsible manner. And I think some of it is not maybe done in a, a way that uh, it should be. But that's, remember, we can't, we can't, forget about any tool. So I work with a lot of organic producers and they're doing good things and they're making some extra money. And once again, we can't do it just off of one idea or one method. It's gonna take a lot, so yes. Um, people are doing it, they're successful. We've just chosen not to. Okay. So how do you manage a healthy regenerative farm without pesticides or insecticides? How do you maintain pests? Um, the cool part about it is when you start getting it in balance and you start having diversity in plants that are around, um, you'll have more beneficials than as far as pest wise than you will, uh, you know, the bad pests. Nature mitigates that, nature takes care of that. We've got to see it here, um, you know, when you, yeah, when you start hearing the birds sing, you know, you just know you're starting to get it right. Because birds don't sing out in a cornfield. They're going to sing in the trees and the grass and things like that. Everything is was perfectly set up to take care of the other and keep it in balance. So when you do that, especially on the insect side, you know, we haven't sprayed anything now for 10 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. Weeds, different issue. It's, it's, it's a tougher deal to think about because um, this soil is confused and when you start to switch it out of that system, it doesn't know how to respond. So instead of switching it right away like we did, we really recommend you know, two or three years of cover crops ahead. So you're starting to hold that weed pressure back. We're always gonna have weeds. You know, and, and weeds are a plant that that were put here too, and they're actually the best cover crop because they know exactly where to come and their nutrient values and everything are really high grazing, it works great. But 
it, it's it's more delicate to try to get that in place. But once you do, you will hold back a lot of the weeds. You may have some weeds, but that there again back to perception. The people that like black soil don't like any kind of weeds either. So if we think about in history, we've tried to eradicate weeds for you know a couple hundred years in in this country, and we've never gotten rid of one weed. All we do is just aggravate them. So we have to get it back into balance. Okay, now, so we got some claim that if all farms were, regener were regenerative or sustainable, there would not be enough food to feed everyone on the planet. Is there any truth to this and how would one respond to this claim if it's false? Or just how would you respond to it in general? Well, I would say, I, I would really question where the genesis of that question comes from, because most likely, and I've heard it a hundred, hundreds of times. So most likely the people that always pose that question are the people making some money or getting benefits off the current system. You know, we have to feed the world, you know, we, all that stuff. When we think about what we raise in Nebraska, we raise feed and fuel. We do not raise hardly any food. You don't go eat field corn. If it got bad enough, we would. But, but when everyone's doing it, this system worked amazingly well so many different times in history. More people on the land raising actual food. I remember it as a kid. You know, We got rid of our chickens, but our neighbor had chickens. We had two milk cows. They didn't have milk cows. You just traded. Everyone that's against that system is most likely totally brainwashed or totally getting they're on the take in that some way, shape, or form. So I, you know, I'm sarcastic and a smart ass most of the time. I tell them to crack a book on agriculture history and then come back and we'll have a discussion. Perfect. All right, and then this isn't a question, but this was someone um, was more commenting on the question about community gardens. They said for a great example of community gardens in Lincoln, you can check out the Holly Hamlet project. So I'll throw that plug, plug out there. Mm. They do a great job. Mm -hmm. They do. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> Let's see. Okay and they sent a link for it. All right, that looks like all the questions unless another one pops in here. Um, and we do have um, a couple about getting your contact info, things like that. And then that more, that governmental question that, that we can hit in a, in a minute. But I wanna thank everyone for joining and listening today. And I really wanna thank Dell um, for talking. This was a very, very good presentation. And I know I learned a lot and enjoyed it. Um, I also wanna remind everybody as you, as you click off here to again, please do that really quick survey. It should not take you more than two minutes, um, but yeah. So well, thank you. Del, do you thank wanna- you for having Mm -hmm. We really appreciate you. What would be the